Thank you. And yeah. uh, please share the, the video file later on. I, you know, I apologize. I don't know what's go what's wrong with this. Uh, I never had this kind of problem before. Uh, I see a chat, um, video post. Uh, am I alive? <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Now. Can you see me move? Okay, good. Yes. So hopefully this works. So we will see. Uh, screen, screen broadcast. Okay. Go to my slides. Is it full screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So sorry for the trouble, but anyway, let, let us get started. So uh, as you all know, you know, we are starting with this remote instruction, unfortunately, because of Omicron. Hopefully we get back to in-person instruction in, in a couple of weeks, but uh, this is the way we get started. And as you all know, this is the, the Physics 151 Quantum Field Theory Primer. And I'm the instructor Hitoshi Murayama. And uh, let me introduce myself uh, at, the, at, the, at the beginning uh, today. So this is how I look like. And you can see I'm so old that I, I took a picture with Albert Einstein together. And obviously that's not true. So uh, this is actually a, 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 an actor uh, who uh, uh, I was invited to a TV show in Japan after the, uh, the famous picture of the black hole was taken. And I was supposed to explain what that was about uh, to the uh, uh, general audience. And this uh, the broadcast, the NHK, that's sort of the Japanese analog BBC, did actually such a serious job that uh, he, they got actually an actor who is Iranian, it just so happens, uh, the, who has the same build as the way uh, Albert Einstein was and, and applied this kind of makeup like a Star Wars movie to make him really look like Albert Einstein. And they even reproduced the entire office of this uh, uh, just according to the picture they have taken right after his death. So even the script in the blackboard is supposed to be authentic. But anyway, so, so he's not a real Albert Einstein, unfortunately, but I was, are feeling really honored to shake hands with this actor in this TV show. Anyway, so that's uh, 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 how I look like. Just a little bit more about me. So uh, uh, I was born in Tokyo, Japan, and I grew up in Germany, though, for the age of uh, 11 to 14. And I'm a theoretical particle physicist. And I also work on cosmology, astrophysics, sometimes even a quantum metaphysics. I, I, I try to work rather broadly on many different areas of physics. Uh, I was once a, a, a member of a, a neutrino experiment in Japan called CAMLAN, which actually have demonstrated that neutrinos actually do oscillate. And we have seen two cycles of neutrino oscillations in the real data uh, for the neutrinos coming from nuclear power plants. So that was actually very exciting for me. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and I even received the breakthrough prize uh, as a uh, member of this collaboration. So uh, that, that was not too bad. And right now I'm also the PI of uh, uh, the instrumentation collaboration for astronomy for the Subaru telescope called the Prime Focus Spectrograph PFS. And I love biking on Berkeley Hills. That's the exercise I do. I also love music. And uh, uh, so that, that's who I am. So uh, the, let me get started with the course uh, here. So this, this course is about basic introduction to quantum field theory. And the QFD is really the foundation of modern physics, which spans for many, many different areas, but it has this reputation of being notoriously difficult. And so hopefully I, I can make this uh, uh, rather difficult subject QFD uh, accessible. It, and, and this is not meant to be QFD as a whole, but it's really meant to be an introduction to QFD. And ideally, if you find the subject interesting, uh, you should take a course at the grad graduate level later on. And uh, this, I also uh, the, the, the bit make my best effort trying to touch on many different areas of physics using QFD uh, as a basis of formulation, which ranges from AMO physics, atomic molecular optical physics, condensed matter physics, astrophysics to particle physics, I also touch up briefly on nuclear physics, I think, on, on the course of this course. So uh, that's the, the idea. And the QFT is actually a very important foundation of modern physics because it's, of course, obviously, is a quantum physics. Uh, Q is, is quantum. But it also incorporates statistical mechanics and relativity in a very uh, uh, non-trivial fashion. So it, in some sense, QFT unifies everything you learn in physics. So it has the stat mech in it, has relativity in it, 
has quantum physics in it, has field theory in it. And so QEFT really sort of unites them together. And, and that's the, the reason why this is such a versatile tool in many different areas of physics now. And the discourse was initiated by strong demands from undergraduate students like you. And so do you actually the guinea pig? Uh, this is actually still kind of experimental, but uh, I hope that this is actually a, going to become a permanent offering in a department. So this is the fourth time in a department where QFD is taught at the undergraduate level. And uh, as I said, it's likely to become a permanent offering, but this is still at that stage of uh, doing experiments. And that's why you see a picture of the guinea pig. And the idea here is that the, the, uh, I'm trying to bridge the gap from quantum mechanics, you studied already 137A and B, that's the prerequisite, to the graduate level QFD courses. And in the case of Berkeley, we have actually a two semester course on QFD at the graduate level. But jumping into that from undergraduate quantum mechanics, there is some gap, which is not easy to fill. So this course is meant to fill that gap so that if you uh, take this course, and if you're interested, you can take the graduate level QFD courses if you like, at least that's the idea. And by the way, I, I'm using slides because it's remote instruction and uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, uh, go slowly. When it, whenever I use slides, there's a tendency that I go fast. And, and the reason I'm using this animation is to try to, to slow myself down. Uh, 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 I, I'm forcing myself to slow down that way. And hopefully that's not too distracting. And so, so that's the, the course. And the, uh, as announced, this is the textbook and the title is Quantum Field Theory for the Gifted Amateur. And this book had been written by actually experimental quantum metaphysicists. And so uh, they are trying to be humble here. They call themselves gifted amateur because they are not theorists developing QFD themselves. So they are in some sense users of QFD, but that's actually great because this is meant to be introduction. And I have to tell you though, that I won't follow this book closely. It, it covers the same contents like what, what I cover in, 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 in lectures. So that's why this is actually a great compliment to the lectures. And, and you can also look up many other subjects which I don't have time to cover. So that's great. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I don't follow this too closely. So this is actually a great resource for you and uh, uh, that you can read it on the size of taking my, uh, uh, listening to my lectures and, and, and putting them together, I believe you give you the big, big best picture of what QFD is about. At the same time, I try to provide as many lecture notes as I can uh, along the line of my lectures so that that would also complement my lectures. So hopefully three of them together will give you the best picture of QFD. So that's the, the idea. So as I said already, there are prerequisites and uh, the 137AB quantum mechanics are prerequisites. And I also recommend that you take uh, a physics uh, 112. And uh, now that I'm actually doing this on iPad, I don't, I'm not sure I can actually do the polling. Let's see, uh, polls, quizzes. Yeah, so uh, once logged in for multiple devices, there isn't an issue about the polling. Uh, if, if I can actually. Oh, Professor, I think see. I can launch the poll myself. Oh, uh, can you do that? Yes, does anybody see it? Yeah. Okay, so the first question is whether you have taken 121 and please fill out the polls. 112, I'm sorry. And this is the course on statistical mechanics. And I don't see the poll. <laughs> <laughs> this is bizarre. But if, if everybody sees the poll, can, can, feel, can you fill that out? Okay, we have 34 out of 35 responses. Okay, okay. and so what's the result? Okay, so we have 54% yes, 23% no, and 23% taking it this semester. Okay, thank you, Ryan. So that's very helpful. And another course that's sort of uh, useful for this course is the relativity uh, uh, course 139. Again, another poll uh, so that you can fill it out, whether you have taken it or you have not taken it or you're taking it this semester. Okay, I've launched the poll. Good, kind of exciting, huh? Okay, 
Okay, it looks like 18% yes, 60% uh, no, and 25% taking it this semester. Okay, so far larger fraction of you have taken StatMic or taking it now, but for relativity, that's low. So when I get to discuss relativity in a way that I unify quantum physics and relativity into QFT, I try to give you some sort of preliminary uh, introduction on that to cover the subject. So don't worry if you have not taken it, I try to cover it as much as I can. Okay, thank you, Ryan. So the, the one of the reasons why QFT is so useful in physics is in some sense that is really towards this goal of what some people call Einstein's dream. So as physicists, we always strive to try to understand and explain phenomena in nature and that's why we all love physics. We have, you can explain why the sky is blue. We come back and talk about this also later in this course. And so uh, that, that's the, 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 what physicists do. And so according to Einstein, one of the sort of the uh, biggest goal in physics is trying to identify an underlying simplicity behind vast phenomena in nature. So there are many, many different kinds of phenomena we observe in nature on our planet, outside the planet, in the universe, or in a microscopic scale in the laboratory. Whatever we look at, we try to identify this underlying simplicity. So that's why we love physics. And, and he dreamed to come up with a unified description of everything. So sometimes we talk about the of everything. In fact, he tried to unify electromagnetism and the theory of gravity. Uh, in this case, of course, that's a general theory of gravity, uh, a relativity, but he actually failed. And in addition, he refused to believe in quantum mechanics. So that's another thing that was peculiar about him. But of course, we now do believe quantum mechanics is the correct description of nature. So uh, in some sense, the QFD is really about trying to bring them all together. And, and of course, physics historically has seen many uh, uh, examples of unifying ideas into more simpler theory. And as you all know, the Newton unified planets and apples. So by looking at an apple falling from a tree, uh, that he discovered the uh, universal law of, of gravity. And, and so that's at least how the story goes. And, and apparently this story is actually not quite correct. And so uh, it's not that the apple fell from a, uh, a tree, plonked on his head, and that's how he came up with inspiration. Uh, but it, his story, uh, apparently it is true that he owned an apple tree. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go to a campus of University of Tokyo, you see actually descendant of Newton's apple tree uh, by uh, many, many generations later. So apparently Newton really did own an apple tree. But anyway, the story is that by looking at the way apple falls on a tree, then he discovered that the apple is being pulled by our planet. And, and by doing sort of a Duncan experiment, thinking about how apple may be moving initially, then the, it's like a cannon. Then an apple would uh, drop on the ground uh, far away from where you are. And if you keep doing it and faster and faster, eventually he theorized that apple can turn around the entire planet and come back to you. So that's how, how that we now understand how the moon moves around the, the planet Earth. So, so that way, he really tried to unify the motion of daily objects like an apple and heavenly objects like planets, moon, and, and so on. And, and out of this unification came two important things, namely Newtonian mechanics and also the universal law of gravity. So that's how the unification actually led to two important discoveries, which we really rely on, on uh, doing many, many different things, not just even in physics, but also in engineering. If you're designing a bridge, of course, you need to know Newtonian mechanics to make sure the bridge doesn't fall right away and that it's stable and it's uh, 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 robust and so on. So uh, unification always leads to really a power of describing phenomena many phenomena in many cases, and, and is also a predictive so that we can use it for many different purposes. And the same kind of unification happened, uh, was uh, done by Maxwell. Uh, he unified electricity and magnetism into the theory of electromagnetism. And so that's also a very powerful theory, which predicts that the light is actually an electromagnetic wave, and we can also communicate with the radio with it, and we can uh, also understand many different optical phenomena using this unification. We understand why the, uh, the, the compass points to the north and so on and so forth. So again, 
this is a very powerful theory as a result of unification. We have very uh, 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 big power in making predictions on the electromagnetic phenomena. And that's how we can uh, uh, do a lot of physics. And in electromagnetism, of course, again, applies to many, many different things uh, from uh, the communication to uh, uh, the plasma physics, uh, like nuclear fusion is one of the things that many physicists are working on, understanding phenomena uh, in the galactic level, for example, galactic magnetic field, magnetars, uh, uh, active galactic nuclei. So all these things are now uh, uh, explained by the single theory of electromagnetism. And around the time of Einstein, uh, there were sort of new phenomena coming out uh, from atomic physics. And that, of course, eventually led to quantum mechanics, uh, worked out by many uh, different people, uh, going back to Planck, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Dirac, and so on and so forth. And, and at the, also at the same time, uh, various phenomena had become discovered from the nuclear physics, like alpha decay, beta decay, and gamma decay of nuclei. So that was the time. And when Einstein came out, and what he did is to try to sort of reconcile the Maxwell's electromagnetism and Newtonian mechanics, because at the face value, they were contradicting with each other. They couldn't be dealt with together. And, and that was a, a problem for Einstein. So he came up with this theory of special relativity and basically modified Newtonian mechanics to be consistent with electromagnetism. And so uh, uh, that, as a result, we have now the theory of special relativity where we talked about this real things like time gets delayed if you move fast, uh, the, 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 the distance will shrink if you move fast, and so that you have to do this Lorentz translation instead of Galilean boost to, to go from one reference room to another. And all these things are now in, uh, uh, the important part of physics. And uh, we can actually observe this time delay uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, in, in the high energy physics experiments, for example. And so this was actually not, not a unification because special relativity does not contain electromagnetism. So he made mechanics consistent with electromagnetism, but he didn't unify them. That's why he was still frustrated. He wanted to do actual unification. And the unification he did in the end is the unification of special relativity and gravity into his theory of general relativity. So general relativity uh, now tells you how gravity behaves on, for example, the large scales, and uh, the, it also incorporates relativity. So it turns out that where the gravity is strong, the time gets delayed. So as a matter of fact, if you are using GPS system on your iPhone, then the iPhone actually knows general relativity to make corrections for the relativist time delay. So because we're using the signal from artificial satellites, GPS satellites, to identify your location and time, but satellites are uh, uh, far above us. So they feel a little bit weaker gravity from a planet Earth than we on the ground. So as a result, our clock is more delayed than the clock on these uh, GPS satellites. And so the clocks don't uh, uh, go uh, uh, with the same rate. So uh, you have to make corrections for that. So if you don't make the correction for this general relativity effects, then it turns out that your GPS system uh, goes wrong by tens of miles every day. So it's actually very crucial for the system to work. So general relativity is now a very predictive theory. It's a very powerful theory. It does contain both special relativity and theory of gravity in it. And so that was a true unification which Einstein achieved. But since then, much of the progress had happened on the quantum side of things. And uh, the, you may not have heard about this, but the quantum mechanics, electromagnetism, special relativity, and also some nuclear phenomena like gamma decay are now unified in the theory of quantum electrodynamics, which is called QED for short. And we will be talking about this QED towards the end of this course uh, this semester. And this is an incredible powerful theory, uh, probably the most predictive theory uh, ever in physical sciences. And it turns out that you probably learned of the G fact of electron. So electron has a spin, spin one half. And in addition to the spin, it also has the magnetic dipole moment. And the size of the magnetic moment is G factor two times the size of the spin. But it turns out that if you further include 
relativistic and quantum corrections, it doesn't stay exactly to, we'll come back and talk about this towards the end of this course. It, it actually has a correction of the order of fine structure constant alpha over pi, because alpha is a small number, one over 137. That's why we call the quantum mechanics class physics 137. And one over 137 over pi is like three per mil. So it's a very small correction, but it had been measured. In fact, the theoretical calculations have been done all the way up to the fourth power of alpha over pi. That's actually down to the 12th digit. Experiment had also been done and the G factor had been measured down to the 12th digit. And all 12 digits agree between theory and experiment. So that's how precise the QED is, both in terms of theoretical predictions and also in terms of experimental sensitivity. That's why I told you that this is probably the most precise physical theory ever. And this high level predictivity is really the power that comes from this unification of quantum mechanics, electromagnetism and special relativity, and, and in, in addition, some nuclear physics like gamma decay. And that's what you are going to witness uh, in this course. So that's QED. We don't have time to get to the weak force, the first manifestation of which was the beta decay of the nuclear physics. And the strong force, the first manifestation was alpha decay in nuclear physics. But we collectively, the physics community, have achieved unification of QED and the weak force into what is called the electroweak theory. So in the electroweak theory, uh, it, 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 both electrodyna electrodynamics and weak interactions are now unified into the single framework. And because it's based on QED, it also has quantum mechanics and special relativity in it as well. So now we are getting even grander unification of many different areas of physics into the same theory. And strong force became the theory of the, what is called the quantum chromodynamics. And the electroweak theory and the theory of strong force together is called the standard model of particle physics. And you may have heard of this name before. But standard model particle physics does not unify electroweak theory and theory of the strong interaction called QCD. It just, just put them in parallel. So there is an idea that maybe this electroweak theory does become unified with a strong force. That is another way of saying that electromagnetism, weak interaction, and strong interaction are all part of a single force, which look different for us at the energy scale we observe and do experiments with, but ultimately at very high energies and very early on in the universe, all of them were actually part of the same force. And so that's the idea called the grand unification. At this stage, this is still a hypothesis or speculation. But it does make also a definite predictions like proton decay. A proton in our body is stable as far as we can tell. And the first lower limit on the lifetime proton came from just observation that you are alive today. So if proton does decay fast enough, then that will give you some radiation dose just by living yourself. And that would kill you eventually. And obviously that's not happening. So the proton lifetime has to be longer than 10 to the 22 years, just by that observation. And this observation was made by a really ingenious physicist, uh, 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 the, the, um, oops, the, the, the Maurice Goldhaber, who used to be at the uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. And now we have also done experiments specifically looking for the possibility of proton decay. Now we know the lifetime of a proton is longer than 10 to the 34 years. And isn't that amazing? Because the, the age of the universe is only 10 to the 10th years. And we have an experimental data that shows the, the lifetime of proton is 10 to the 34 years. That's 24 orders of magnitude longer than the age of the universe. But anyway, so uh, that's something we are still looking for. And hopefully we see some sign of grand unification sometime in the near future. And again, as you probably all know, there is a hope that we can even bring the general theory of relativity, namely gravity, together with 
all these quantum theories I just outlined into the theory of quantum gravity, possibly the superstring theory. And we don't know if that's true yet, but the many people, including those in a department, are working on the string theory as sort of the hope of ultimate unification of all forces, namely theory of everything. That's sort of what Einstein dreamed while he was alive and hadn't achieved, but maybe we're heading there. Of course, we don't know, uh, but you gotta try. So that's sort of the history of unification that happened in physics. And each time you achieve some level of unification, you gain an incredible power. The theory becomes predictive, a theory becomes reproducible, then theory contains many different parts of physics. And what we get to in this course is to the QED, quantum electrodynamics. Once again, that is supposed to be unification of quantum mechanics, electromagnetism, special relativity, and nuclear physics, part of it like gamma decay. So that's what I hope you will see. Now, just some logistics about the class. So uh, we will have a weekly homework and there will be 12 of them. Each of them is given equal points, 100. And uh, I'd like to conduct another poll. So we need to decide the due dates. And from my experience asking students when I taught this course in the past three times, uh, there were always two camps of students. And, and one uh, camp wanted to finish everything uh, uh, that has to be done by the end of the week so that you can enjoy the weekend. So that they wanted the homeworks due by the end of Friday. Another camp actually rather wanted to work uh, quietly during the weekend and submit the homework at the beginning of the week, namely 9 a.m. on Mondays. So now I'd like to open the poll again. So Ryan, can you do this for me? So uh, you, you choose between these two options, whether homeworks are due by end of Friday or by the beginning of Monday, or you don't care. So these are the three options. Ryan, can you do that? Okay, the poll is up. Almost there. Now comes a okay. drum roll. Here we go. So looks like we have 39% for Friday, 36% for Monday, and 25% say either is fine. Okay. Very close. I have to say that's within systematic error, but poll is poll. So the, uh, the, the largest fraction of you chose Friday as the due, due date for the homework. So let's do that. So the homeworks will be due by end of Friday every week. So that's the, what we chose. Okay, so uh, these were the three choices, but the choice had been already made. So we go for the first option. And I do encourage group studies. So you're welcome to work with uh, your fellow students. And for the office hour, I will set up the doodle poll later and, and ask you to fill that out. And so I'd like to choose the time that's convenient for the, the most of you. So we will see. And there will be midterm. So I assigned 200 points to that. And there will be also be the final. Yes, I also 200 points to that too. And uh, the, I also set up the Piazza uh, site for this course. And if you actually download the slides, uh, which is already now posted on B courses, and then if you click on that, that and you can go to the Piazza site. And also on the syllabus page, you can also see the link to the Piazza page. So you're welcome to post questions and you can also have discussions among yourselves. And of course, I and TAs will be watching and chime in whenever it's necessary. So uh, uh, hopefully this would actually help everybody out. And the videos of lectures will be posted on YouTube, assuming that the recording is working fine for now. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I really appreciate what Ryan is doing for us. And uh, that might actually give you a little bit of concern if you are concerned that your name and possibly even yourself would show up on YouTube, which is accessible for, for anybody in the world. You can change your name. You can turn the video off so that you don't feel comfortable about this. And uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, how I handle this unfortunate situation that uh, the instruction is giving only remotely. So in case you have some a uh, uh, problem that you cannot uh, sign into the Zoom uh, uh, at, the, at the time of the lecture synchronously, then you can actually uh, uh, go to the YouTube site and watch that later. So that's what I intend to do. I also intend to post the slides uh, on the syllabus page 
before each class. And this slide is already posted on B courses. So you can download this. So as you listen to my lectures, having slides handy would allow you to go back and forth uh, in case you just got lost but in a transition from one slide to another. So you can always go back and look at it. So hopefully that will also help you dealing with this online format of lectures. And get, thanks to this uh, big enrollment, the capacity of this course is 40 students. Uh, I know that there are four students already on the wait list and several others, I think five, uh, waiting uh, from the, uh, the BPI students and also concurrent enrollment from other colleges. And so the department is looking for a bigger room for us now. So in some sense, thanks to the COVID, the department has time to look for the bigger room to uh, and, and increase the capacity uh, for this enrollment. So hopefully that would happen. So, uh, uh, so that's the, the way we are right now. And right now I have provided the Zoom links for the lectures for those students who are now waiting to be enrolled. So hopefully that is also working well for everybody. And we have two GSIs, one GSI for nine hours, another one for 10 hours. And I got just informed that the, the department is willing to pay for our reader as well, working four hours a week. And, and the, this combined hopefully would cover everything that's needed for this course. Uh, given that the large size of the class, we need as much help as possible. And so, so that's uh, uh, the, the basic idea. And uh, this, is, this is an example of the YouTube uh, uh, channel. So if you actually look, look up my name on YouTube, you'll find my channel. You can even see lectures I have actually given in the past. And all the lectures from the last year when I taught this course are still there. So you can actually go and, and check out ahead of the, 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 the lecture uh, what's coming in, in the next uh, class, for example. So uh, hopefully that will be a useful resource for you. And uh, you can also find some other material uh, when I taught, for example, the, uh, uh, the uh, QFD at the graduate level two years ago, uh, towards the end of the semester, we switched to the online format. So those lectures are also posted there if you are curious and want to check it out. So uh, so that's that's the, something you can find. And here is the link. And of course, it's much easier probably if you just look up my name on YouTube. Temperature, too cold. Oh, okay. But anyway, anyway, so that these are the, the two GSIs. Uh, she is uh, Bethany Suter, and here's her email address. Again, you can find this information on the syllabus page. She will be working for us nine hours a week. And she's actually my student. And, and she has started doing research on beyond the standard model physics. She already has finished a paper with me on how we might understand why there is matter in the universe, but no antimatter, which is actually a major puzzle uh, in cosmology and fundamental physics. So she has a theory of her own on this question. And of course, to work on this kind of problem, she has to use QFD on a regular basis. Now she's working on another project, which is about a QFD itself, how we can understand yeah, actually the quantum field theory at the non-perturbative level. So in this course, we'll be uh, looking at only basically the perturbation theory in QFD, but in some cases like strong interaction, we need to go beyond the perturbation theory, which is actually a very, very technically difficult subject, but she's working on that. So I'm sure you will learn greatly from interacting with her. Another GSI is Imo, and I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name, uh, last name, Albrichievich and I may be saying wrong. And, and I asked him to come in towards the end of the class today. So five minutes before the end. So I asked him to introduce himself. We'll learn the correct uh, pronunciation of his last name. So he will be working 10 hours for us a week. And uh, he actually took the graduate level QFD while he was an undergrad student here in Berkeley two years ago. And uh, uh, he's now a graduate student uh, here in Berkeley. And so he moved from undergrad to graduate uh, uh, school, uh, uh, both within uh, the, uh, 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 on, on his campus. And because he has already taken the graduate level QFD, he knows this stuff already. So uh, he is, will be also a great instructor for you. So anyway, that's sort of the logistic and the introduction uh, on what the course is about. So let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Any questions? Let me stop share so that I can see some of you.
Oh, by the way, uh, of course, you're welcome to turn off video and 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 and, and the, the audio if you want. But I do appreciate at least some of you uh, that has the video on so that I get some visual feedback. So I don't want to feel like I'm talking the black hole. And I really appreciate some of you showing your faces. So uh, at least I'm talking to some human beings out there. So that I, I that sense is actually very important for me. And thank you so much. All right, somebody was uh, uh, speaking up. Sorry, I interrupted you. Who was yeah. that? Uh, hi, I'm Roberto. Roberto? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask if you're going to post some lecture notes or apart from the slides or something like that, more like uh, mm -hmm. redacted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, if you actually check out B courses, you already see many lecture notes posted from the time when I taught it a year ago. And so I might update some of that as we go on, but pretty much everything uh, is there already, so you can check them out. And also on syllabus page, I posted all slides and links to the video uh, recordings of the lectures uh, from the last time. And as we go on, I will update the link to slides uh, to the newer ones for this semester. And once the lecture is over, then I'll, I also update the link to the, 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 the video lectures uh, in this semester. So I changed the links. But if you look at the other dates, which had not been taught yet, you have links to the slides from the last year and you have links to the video lectures from the last year, so you can check them out uh, 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 ahead of the time. So you will have material on the lecture notes, slides, videos, and also textbook, and hopefully that together would uh, uh, cover whatever you need. Okay, thanks for the question, Roberto. Any other questions? And I really do encourage you to ask questions and never feel your question is dumb because no question is dumb. And if you ask, if you think you're asking a dumb question, that actually ends up helping other students as well. So I was feeling the same way when I was a student myself. And I tend to ask lots of questions because I was just a curious person. And I always felt like I was a studious guy in, the, in a class. But only years later, uh, other students, my peers, told me that they really liked the fact that I asked those questions because they got to learn, uh, which was they were afraid to ask, but I asked the questions for them in a sense. So uh, don't be afraid to ask any student uh, questions you might have. Uh, and I would like to make this class as interactive as possible. Okay, any other questions at this stage? Okay, so if you do ask, uh, have questions, then please raise your hand. And because I'm on iPad, I have difficulties actually seeing the, uh, the, the hand raise and stuff like this. So again, I have to rely on Ryan to uh, uh, shout out. If somebody raises his or her hand, the Ryan, please tell me that somebody's waiting for me. If somebody posts the chat, again, the Ryan, sorry, I'm asking you to do a lot uh, and, 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 and call that out. And, uh, uh, and, and also uh, you can just turn on the, uh, the audio and start speaking and interrupt me if you're not getting my attention. All right, so let me go back to the slides then. Start broadcast. And hopefully I wouldn't have this problem again with my computer uh, on Friday. I don't know what's really going on here. Okay, so back to my slides. So now I'd like to sort of motivate you why studying QFD is a good thing. And of course I gave you already a little bit of a spiel uh, in, in, the, in a way that it really unifies different branches of physics. But the reason I actually find QFD important for myself and, and, and all of you uh, stems from the frustration I had when I was learning uh, quantum mechanics back in, uh, when, when, when I was an undergrad myself. And frustration was very simple. So when you go to quantum mechanics class, so in our case, that's 137, then the instructor uh, gave me a lot of motivations why I should study quantum mechanics. And those motivations, or actually these experimental facts that we see discrete photon energies from atomic transitions. And we also uh, have to understand photoelectric effect. When you send in a photon, then you can sort of uh, 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 knock off an electron from material, but you need to have a short enough wavelength for the photon for that to happen. And from the point of view of classical mechanics, any wavelength of photon can enough energy and so that it should be able to knock off electron from the material 
but apparently that's not true. So you need to have a short enough wavelength and short enough wavelengths of course corresponds to high enough energy for the individual photon. So the first discrete photon energies had been explained by the fact that atomic levels have definite energies, energies are quantized, and then the energy of the photon from transition corresponds to the energy difference between the atomic states. That's why they have definite energies, and hence the photons come with discrete energy spectrum. And the photon also needs to have enough energy to knock off an electron from the material, and that's the photoelectric effect. And also we learn the Compton scattering is something we don't understand from classical mechanics. And in classical mechanics, when you send in an electromagnetic wave, electromagnetic wave has a definite frequency. And electromagnetic wave has electric field, so that would actually shake electron with that frequency. And when the electron is shaken, that's an accelerated motion, and therefore electron would radiate uh, electromagnetic wave. But that wave is radiated by the electron shaken by the electromagnetic wave or definite frequency. So the radiated electromagnetic wave should also have the same frequency. So that's what classical mechanics tells you. But in quantum physics, we have the scattering of the photon in electron, like a billiard ball. The photon comes in as a particle that hits the electron and they scatter. And as a result, the, low, the final state photon has a different energy, lower energy from the initial state photon. And therefore, the final state photon has a lower frequency compared to the initial frequency of the photon. And that's something you would never thought would be possible in classical mechanics. So once again, that is a, meant to be the motivation why you have to study quantum mechanics. And we also learn the spin is quantized and you learn about stone gerlach experiment and then spins come in these quantized steps in the case of electron plus one half and minus one half. Again, in classical mechanics, angular momentum can take any values, but you see experimentally spin is actually quantized. And you also see this weird phenomenon. We always thought electron to be a particle but now we also see the electron to behave like a wave, like in two slit experiment. And that goes back to the Davidson and Gurm experiment where you see the interference of electron wave. So even though we used to think electron was a particle, now we know the electron behaves both as a particle and wave. And if it behaves like a wave, it should also lead to the interference phenomenon, which had been observed experimentally. So these are some of the things you learn on day one in quantum mechanics, you probably did in 137. That's why you got to study quantum mechanics. My frustration when I was an undergrad is that if you look at this list, here I listed five of them, but three of them have to do with a photon. And in the entire course on quantum mechanics, I have never seen a photon actually uh, coming back since the day one, <clears throat> that was a big frustration. So basically I get told to study quantum mechanics because you have to understand these phenomena that involve photon, but I never got any explanation how photon arises, how photon interacts, and how these phenomena are explained at the end of the day in the entire year of quantum mechanics class. And that was very, very frustrating. And only later on I learned that the reason for it is because talking about the photon actually requires the quantum field theory. Namely that what we do in classical physics is to deal with the photon as an electromagnetic wave. That is the wave uh, explained in the Maxwell theory of electromagnetism. But the, that wave cannot behave like a particle, namely a photon. So only when you quantize field, in this case, field means electromagnetic field that describes the electromagnetic wave and therefore a photon in the end. And only after quantizing this field, you find a particle that is a photon. So it turns out that when you want to discuss a photon to understand this discrete photon energy from atomic transitions, if you want to understand photoelectric effect, if you want to understand Compton scattering, you have to actually quantize field. So only after you learn QFT, you get to see a photon in quantum mechanics. 
So it turns out the QFT is a must. It's not an option. So you learn all this stuff in quantum mechanics class that you have to understand, which is not explainable in classical physics. But to, to understand it, the quantum mechanics class is not everything. You have to go to QFT so that you get to see a photon, which you will do in this course, and so that you can understand these phenomena now in full fledged quantum field theory rather than quantum mechanics. So I was very frustrated when, when I was undergrad, and you might be in that situation right now. Uh, you uh, have studied quantum mechanics, but you probably have not seen a photon, depending on who taught that course, actually. And, and so uh, you get to see photon for sure in this class. And, and so you now understand this particle wave duality uh, uh, in the end. And the particle wave duality, uh, in the case of photon, goes from wave, electromagnetic wave, to a photon particle. And photon behaves both as a wave and particle. But initial description you learn is electromagnetism, and therefore it's a wave. So we go from a wave to particle in the case of photon. In the case of the electron, though, the electron used to be a particle in classical mechanics. But now you learn in 137 that it behaves like a wave too. So in this case, particle is a starting point. Then you turn to wave in quantum mechanics. But both in the case of electron and photon, they behave both as a wave and particle. And that's the particle wave duality. So neither electron or photon is pure particle or pure wave. It's both at the same time. And that's something that's really weird. It, it doesn't mesh with our sort of a, a intuition of physics, which we see in daily phenomena. But in the, but in the end, this is actually the only way we can understand electrons or photons or anything else at the microscopic level. And so we have to understand this particle wave duality. Everything is both a wave and particle at the same time. So it turns out that it's a matter of convenience which one is the correct classical limit? And you might say, oh, that sounds very stupid because we know classically, electron is a particle, photon is a wave. But it turns out that what we do in quantum field theory is we start with a wave description of electron, just like what we do for the photon, and then quantize the wave to get the particles out. So we apply the same way we describe photon also to the electron. And it's a matter of convenience, I claim. The reason being that, you know, that our language we grew up with had been shaped our daily experience, which is purely classical. So we don't have the right language to talk about quantum phenomena in our natural language. That's why we had to invent a new language to describe a quantum phenomena. And hence we learn the Hilbert space, wave functions, operators, and all the stuff, which are not part of a natural language, but we have to rely on this kind of mathematical language to describe the quantum phenomenon. And given that, given that our language is inadequate to describe quantum uh, phenomena anyway, then it is actually a matter of convenience whether we would like to start with a wave description or would like to start with a particle description. And it, it turns out the QFT chooses the former. We always describe everything at the beginning as a classical wave. Then we quantize this classical wave, hence the field, because wave is a field, uh, wave, uh, any wave follows a field equation. And after quantizing the field, then we find particles. That's the way we describe particle wave duality in quantum field theory. And that sounds very bizarre, I'm sure, but we actually get to this idea uh, as we go on. So QFD regards wave as the correct choice for the starting point of the discussion. But once you go from FD, yeah, so let me finish the sentence and I get back to you. So once you go from FD, that is the classical theory of wave, and go to QFD, then you quantize a wave, and what do you find is a particle out of a wave, and therefore your description is both wave and particle at the same time. 
Okay, so back to your question. So let me stop sharing. Go ahead. Um, so before, like um, in early years of studies, we learned Compton mm -hmm. scattering using the interpretation of um, photon. Mm -hmm. Understanding that, um, without understanding that it can also be a wave, like mm -hmm. uh, from the very beginning. So um, there are two questions. First of, the, first of all is, um, since you've just mentioned that um, wave should be a better choice of interpretation. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't, because when I, when I heard about like quantum mechanics, I already have a puzzle is that whether or not like wave is the ground truth instead of the particle picture. And the second question will be, um, since we just talked about the quantization, um, so does it mean that the quantization of field is um, the cause for producing particle properties from uh, original uh, wave property? So is there a casualty there? Okay, so the first question is, is that you're right. So we chose the description starting wave. So in principle, we could have started with either, but it turns out that the wave description is better uh, and when you actually get to relativity. So if you're dealing with non-relativistic system, we could have done it either way. But when you go to relativity, there's an additional requirement that we have to treat space and time on equal footing, right? Because relativity is about space time and space and time come together. But that's actually very difficult to do in quantum mechanics, because as you have already studied, the position, namely space, is an operator, but time is a parameter. You like Schrodinger equation using time as an argument, as a parameter describing the time evolution of the system. But position is an eigenvalue of the position operator. There's no time operator. There's no X parameter. So you are treating space and time in a very asymmetric fashion. They are not treated equally. And that's the something you have to change when you want to unify relativity and quantum mechanics, which we will do in the second half of this course. So then it turns out that using quantum mechanics is impossible. It's not people haven't tried, people did try, but it turns out that it doesn't give you a useful theory to deal with. You run into all kinds of issues. I will mention some of these issues also when we get to talk about this. So it turns out that starting with a wave is optional if you're only dealing with non relativistic systems, but it's a must when you actually go to the relativistic quantum field theory. So it turns out that instead of promoting time to an operator, which you might have guessed, what we do is to demote possession from an operator to a parameter. Because when you deal with a wave, like electromagnetic wave or uh, uh, the wave on the ocean or a sound wave, whatever, wave is a function of both space and time, right? So you have different uh, amplitude of the wave depending on where you are. And it also changes the function of time, wave actually propagates. So the wave is described by a function of both space and time. So both space and time are parameters of the wave. So that's the way you can treat time and space on an equal footing. And that's actually much better if you wanna bring in relativity. X and T are both parameters. Neither of them is an operator. But of course we are dealing with quantum physics. So something has to be an operator. So it turns out that field, which is a function of both X and T, turns out to be an operator. And that's why we're talking about quantum field theory. So both time and, and space become parameters. They are not operators, but field is an operator. That is a totally new concept you haven't seen before, but hopefully you get used to it as we go on. And using this field as an operator, you can describe it both as a wave and particle at the same time. So that, that gives you the correct description of quantum phenomena at the end of the day. So that I think answers your second part of the question. So did I answer both your question in the end? 
Yes, I think so. I okay, do great. have another question, but Go ahead. Uh, I need to. Go ahead, Nin. Um, okay. Um, I have um, heard before, like, there is a propagator operator. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it has the element of time. So is there a particular reason why we cannot, why we, why we do not promote time as an operator? Yeah, so it turns out that time is reversible, right? Time only flows in one way, yes. but not the other way. Yes. So in that way, the time is kind of special. Mm -hmm. And if you try to treat time as an operator, mm -hmm. then it's very difficult to implement this notion of causality, namely time only moves forward in time, not never backward in time. So it turns out again, that if you want to unify relativity and quantum mechanics, then you have to treat time equally with space but with this additional restriction that time only moves forward, never backwards. And that actually makes it very, very difficult to treat time as an operator at the end of the day. I see. Thank you so much. That's an much. excellent question. I'm sure there are other questions at this stage. No? All right. Okay, so let me then get back to my slides. Start broadcast, two, one, zero, now to my slides. Okay, so it turns out that uh, if you want to describe this particle wave duality, if you stick with non-relativistic system, you can start with either one as the classical limit. But when you want to unify relativity with quantum mechanics, it turns out that starting with a wave is the correct choice and that's what we do in, in all cases at the end of the day. And let me also give you uh, various uh, the reasons why QFT is needed. So as I said already, as long as you're dealing with non relativistic systems, then quantum mechanics and QFT are, either of them is actually good. You can start with particles, like what you did in quantum mechanics, or you can start with a wave, like what we are going to do in QFT. And it turns out that QFT is completely equivalent to multi-particle quantum mechanics. And so you can, you can, you're free to choose. Either way, you get the correct description of the system. But it turns out that QFT is more convenient than multi-particle quantum mechanics. And I'm sure you learned in 137, if you deal with the system with identical particles, let's say you're talking about a boson, then your wave function has to be symmetric under the interchange of two particles. So in this case, I have the n particles in a system and I'm interchanging particle j and particle k. And when you interchange them, your wave function has these two arguments flipped. And then you are supposed to have the plus sign, namely the, the wave function is symmetric under the interchange of the bosons. When you're talking about the fermions, your wave function has to be anti-symmetric, namely that if you interchange two particles, you're supposed to get a minus sign. But you have to do this in some sense by hand. Starting with, for example, each particle's wave function, you take the product of them, then you have to symmetrize it to get a correct wave function for bosons, or you have to anti-symmetrize it to get the correct wave function for fermions. So that's something you have to impose on top of quantum mechanics. So if the quantum statistic is not built in the multi-particle quantum mechanics, that's something you have to impose yourself. But it turns out though, that the QFD doesn't need to do this. This quantum statistics is actually built in in QFD. You don't need to impose it. Once you do QFD, symmetrization or anti-symmetrization just comes out of it. So that's not, not something you impose by yourself, it's something that is an outcome of QFT. In addition, QFT is far more convenient than multi-particle quantum mechanics if you're dealing with, for example, atomic physics or condensed matter physics. And if you pick up a piece of metal, then you find many tens of, uh, 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 10 to the 23 uh, electrons in it. So Avogadro number is 6, 7, 10 to the 23. And if you want to write that wave function of 10 to the 23 particles, you need to specify the wave function with 10 to the 23 arguments in it. 
And that's impossible to deal with. Just writing down the wave function would take millions of years on your notepad. Now, of course, assuming there's enough paper to write them down on. So that's totally impractical. If you wanna deal with a system with a macroscopic number of particles in it, the quantum mechanics works in principle, but totally impractical because you never want to write down a wave function as a function of 10 to the 23 uh, arguments of the wave function. So it turns out that in QFT, you don't need to do this. There's a way of dealing with a state with huge number of particles in it without ever writing down the wave function. So both quantum statistics and multi-particle systems are much easier to deal with in QFT than in standard quantum mechanics. So uh, I emphasize again that in a relativistic, not non-relativistic system, either one is correct. But it turns out that QFT is much better description and it's actually a much more versatile formulation of quantum physics. So that's yet another reason why you wanna study QFT. Okay. And so it turns out that QFT is a great tool for condensed matter physics because of these two reasons. You don't need to impose statistics by hand and you can deal with a system with large number of particles without ever writing down wave function. So that's the reason. There's also need for quantum field theory when you actually go to a process where the number of particles changes. So when you talk about emission of photon from an atom, let's say you have a hydrogen atom in 2p state, that's an excited state of hydrogen, and the electron would drop down to the ground state, that's oneness, by emitting a photon. But try to imagine how you might describe a process where number of particles changes in quantum mechanics. Wave function is a function of fixed number of coordinates, each coordinate describing the position of each particle. But there's no mathematics that would allow you to change the number of arguments of a function. So if you start with a two at, at the electron in 2p state, initial state has only one electron, but the final state has electron in one less state and the photon, so you have two particles in a final state. And there's no way of changing the function of one argument to a function of two arguments as a result of unitary time evolution. Schrodinger equation can never allow you to describe such a process. Schrodinger equation is the time derivative of the wave function given by Hamiltonian operator acting on the wave function so wave function has a fixed number of arguments. It can never jump. So it turns out that quantum mechanics can never ever deal with a process where a number of particle changes. So uh, because uh, given that you are given the motivation to study quantum mechanics, because there are phenomena where number of particle changes, namely the photon can be emitted or photon can be absorbed. You would like to describe that. But it turns out that you really do have to use QFT for this purpose. And QFT can talk about a process where a particle is created. We use the language of creation operator or particle is annihilated. We use the language of annihilation operator for particles. So you can literally create an annihilated particle if you use QFT, but you can never do that in quantum mechanics. So that's another reason why QFT is must when you want to describe such a process. In some cases, you would like to describe system not based on the fundamental degrees of freedom, but based on what is sometimes called emergent degree of freedom. For example, if you uh, hit a piece of metal, then the sound wave will propagate from one end to the other, and you can hear the sound on the other end of the metal pipe. And if you go to quantum description, you'll be talking about a phonon that's the quantum version of a sound, hence phonon. The, the, the. So uh, uh, that's actually emergent degree of freedom because there is no phonon particle as a fundamental degree of freedom. Fundamental degrees of freedom are nuclei and electrons to describe a piece of metal. Then that's an example of emergent degree of freedom. It turns out that QFT is versatile enough that you don't have to use fundamental degrees of freedom, in this case, electrons and nuclei, 
but use phonon as a degree of freedom of a theory. And so you can have a QFD of phonons. You can then forget about electrons and nuclei and can only deal with the phonons if that uh, is your interest. So it turns out that you can uh, focus on degrees of freedom you think are needed for your system and don't have to go back necessarily to the fundamental degrees of freedom. And so you can choose what is your degree of freedom in your theory. That also means that you can deal with the composite states too. That we get to talk about superconductivity uh, later in this course and, and superconductivity deal with something called the Cooper pairs where two electrons form a, some kind of composite bound state. And you can deal with Cooper pairs as a pair, as a degree of freedom in QFT. So your QFT has to deal with bosons because Cooper pairs is made of two electrons, that's a boson. And then you can talk about the, its dynamics using boson at degree of freedom. Instead of the fundamental degree of freedom, in this case, is an electron that is a fermion. So even though you're dealing with system with macroscopic number of fermions, electrons, you can deal with QFD over boson as a description of superconductivity that actually turns out to be extremely useful so that you can actually deal with various phenomena like a, a magnetic vortices, uh, the supercurrent and so on, and Joseph's junction using these boson description of electrons, it turns out. So the QFD is a very flexible language that's why it is a great tool for all areas of physics, as long as you're interested in quantum, uh, uh, the phenomena of it. That's why QFD is used for atomic physics, nuclear physics, particle physics, in addition to condensed matter physics I already mentioned. Professor, okay, any questions question. about this slide? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, so you mentioned that um, the reason why we need um, quantum field theory is because um, for we have a Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger equation is a differentiation which cannot change mm -hmm. the number of arguments, mm -hmm. which in mm -hmm. terms cannot change the number of particles. Right. But the problem is when we learn about quantum mechanics in the in the chapter for um, harmonic oscillators, we see that it is actually symmetric for isotropic um, harmonic oscillators, and then by an algebraic method. Um, we can actually define annihilation and create, is it creation operator? Uh, it's the raising and um, the lowering operators. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it is actually manipulated in quantum mechanics. So me quantum mechanics already has such an operator. So the difference, what's the difference like from quantum field theory, um, annihilation operator and creation operators? To yeah, that's the an, quantum mechanics one. Yeah. yeah, that's an excellent question too, Yin. Uh, so it turns out that in harmonic oscillating quantum mechanics, you have this A and A dagger operators and you may call them creation addition operator, but you are actually not creating a particle. So if we have a harmonic oscillator of say one pendulum, then you have a single particle moving in one dimension. And that uh, the weight at the end of the pendulum uh, has this position operator, and that's what you're dealing with. So you have one particle, which corresponds to this weight at the end of the pendulum, and that's it. And you are describing the motion of this pendulum, and you can use this creation operator to go to excited states of the harmonic oscillator, basically start starting with the, the pendulum at rest. Then you have you, you excited state corresponds to pendulum slightly moving, Second excited state has a slightly bigger motion and so on and so forth. So you are raising the energies, but you are not creating that pendulum. So you call this creation operator, but it should probably be called more correctly as a raising operator, as you said, because all it does is to raise the energy levels, but you never create the pendulum. You never annihilate the pendulum. Pendulum is always there, you are dealing with one degree of freedom of the motion of the pendulum. You never change that. The only thing you are changing is how excited it is or how boring it is, um. namely the ground state. So the, what QFD does is different from this operator in mm -hmm. harmonic oscillator mm -hmm. because you literally 
create a particle. You start with a ground state with no particles in it and use the creation operator to create a particle, second particle, third particle, all the way up to 10 to the 23 particles. And so you literally create particle. So in this case, it's not a raising operator anymore. It's really a creation operator and annihilation operator. Then so that's I, the difference between quantum mechanics and QFT. Sorry, go ahead. Then I have another question because mm -hmm. um, now I understand the differences of both so-called creation operator, which should be called another name, which is the raising operator. However, um, we still have the counting operators. That, um, is it, is it, is it, it is the number operator, I should say, like yep. N, the big N. So right. when we when we actually like, uh, when we have, when we raise it and then we um, lower it, raise it, lower it, raise it, lower it, do it continuously, like it is like, um, it is like counting. I take the ball out, I put it back, I take the ball out to put it back. It's just like mm -hmm. a counting process. Mm -hmm. So is it mean, does it mean that, um, because I count it continuously and counting doesn't change the total number of particles. So this is not essentially also an explanation to not creating a particle. That's right. So the number of operator in quantum mechanics just counts how many times you have raised from the ground state. So it's a measure of how excited the state is. It's a measure of what the energy of the state is, not the number of particles in the system. So the number operator in harmonic oscillator is yet another, I would say wrong name. It just counts the times you have raised the state from the ground state. It doesn't count the number of particles in the state. But when you go to QFT, we define number operator. That literally means number of particles in the system. So you have a state with 10 to 23 particles in it. When you act number operator on the state, then pops out the eigenvalue, which is 10 to the 23. So number operator really does become number of particles when you go to QFT, but not in quantum mechanics. I see. Thank you. Okay. And I saw another question whether lectures will be posted on YouTube even after we return to in-person instruction. And the short answer is I don't know because I have not seen that situation before. So uh, that two years ago, we switched from in-person to online. I never had a opportunity to switch more online to in-person. So I don't know. And, and if you want to have lectures posted on YouTube, even for the in-person lectures, somebody has to volunteer to film the lectures for me. And if you provide the video file of the lectures, and I'd be happy to post that on my YouTube channel. But I can't do that myself because I will be, you know, uh, dealing with a blackboard when I uh, teach a lecture in person. So I can't do that myself. So when you switch back to in-person class, hopefully in a couple of weeks, uh, then I will ask you whether some of you might volunteer to do that for the rest of the class, that you have the video lectures available on YouTube for anybody's uh, uh, use. So that's something we should discuss uh, uh, later. Okay, any other questions at this point? Okay, so I have three minutes left, so let me see I can, finish the, uh, the slides I prepared for today, uh, start broadcast again. Okay, so I finished this slide and then the last slide, I think. So I mentioned this already, if you want to go to relativity and unify that with the quantum mechanics, QFT turns out to be a must. There is no option of dealing with relativistic quantum mechanics. It simply does not exist. And I already mentioned the reason for it. X is an operator, but T is a parameter in quantum mechanics. So they are not treated on an equal footing. If you go to QFT, then you deal with the field. In this case, I use this Greek letter phi, which is a function of X and T. Both X and T are parameters for the field and they are not operators. But it turns out that the phi field is an operator, and that's something we deal with algebraically and quantize. And it turns out that it's not possible to do the uh, equal footing uh, the treatment of Q, X and T in quantum mechanics. So that's why we have to go to QFT. 
And I will also explain a theorem called spin statistics theorem. And you might have already known this empirically. So every spin one half particles, electrons, protons, neutrons, or fermions, and every integer are spin particles, like a phonon and a photon are uh, the bosons. So that actually turns out to be a theorem in relativistic QFT, which you cannot prove in quantum mechanics, but you can in quantum field theory. Also, by unifying QFT and quantum mechanics, the G fact of two for electron becomes an outcome. It's a prediction of QFT, not as an input as you have done in quantum mechanics, which was an arbitrary parameter in your Hamiltonian. And as I already mentioned, it turns out that there's a small corrections to two in, in perturbations theory in power series in fine structure constant. So, and those corrections are also not random numbers. That's something you can compute. We will not get there in this course, unfortunately, because that requires actually something called the loop calculations, which is beyond the scope of this, this class. And hopefully you get actually learn this uh, loop calculations when you take the grad level quantum uh, field theory courses. But it turns out that this is actually a very important consequence of QFT. And also QFT predicts the existence of antiparticles. For an electron, we have a positron. We have for a proton, we have an antiproton. We have also the antineutron for a neutron. And both antiproton and antineutron were discovered here in Berkeley uh, up on the hill and uh, Segre and Chamberlain got Nobel Prize for this. So this uh, the Berkeley is a special place for antiparticles. And the existence of these antiparticles are prediction of quantum field theory, but it's an option in quantum mechanics. And there's yet another theorem called CPT theorem, uh, whether you, uh, in, so it turns out that if you interchange particles and antiparticles and you flip space and also reverse time, then physics stays the same. Hence, C for charge conjugation, switching particles and antiparticles, P for parity, so, uh, flipping space, and T for time reversal. Uh, it turns out that if you do all three operations together, physics remains invariant, which in particular predicts that every antiparticle should have exactly the same mass as its product particle counterpart. So these things, again, can be proven in QFT, but not in quantum mechanics. So therefore, if you are dealing with system which requires relativity and quantum mechanics together, like in particle physics, nuclear physics, and astrophysics, QFT turns out to be a must, not optional. So that's the yet another reason why you need to study QFT. So the, I actually talk about this, uh, the organization of the, uh, uh, of the syllabus, uh, which you can see on B courses but I don't have time to finish this up today. So let me get started with this organization uh, at the beginning of the lecture on Friday. But today was just meant to be sort of the, the spiel, why quantum field theory is important, why it is interesting, why it is useful, and hopefully you are now more interested than ever than uh, before uh, coming to this class today in studying QFT. Okay, so I'm a little bit uh, over time, but I see Bethany. And so let me introduce her. So why don't you turn your uh, uh, audio on and introduce yourself quickly. Hi, um, I'm Bethany Suter. I am a second year grad student. Um, I'm actually working with Satoshi, which is pretty fun. Um, yeah, I do stuff in like particle physics, phenomenology um, and stuff like that. Yeah. Great. Excited to be and working Imo? with y'all. Yeah. And Emo? Hi, I'm um, a first year uh, grad student here. I work with uh, Origanor on string theory, uh, but I had this uh, chance to take this class when it was first time offered with Hitoshi. So it's good to be back here. <laughs> That's right. And, and we really would like to understand how to pronounce your last name. Oh, uh, Albrichevich. Albrichevich. Yes, that's great. Albrichevich. Okay, I, I got to uh, uh, practice up on that. All right, so that's the end of the lecture today. So thanks for coming, and I see you on Friday. And hopefully we get uh, the increase of capacity for this class so that uh, those of you on the waiting list can enroll officially. All right. Professor, and, I still have a question. Okay, you can, you can ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, since you mentioned that um, 
since we just uh, talked about um, the number operator, so-called number operator in harmonic oscillators, I, I don't know, um, like if I don't say number operators, what can I say uh, like for the name? But um, the operator is formed by A and A deck. But um, the I have a question, like because if we are counting like the excitation energy levels, then the problem will be if I already have um, if I already have Hamiltonian as an operator to give us the eigenvalue, which is essentially the energy of state, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. why do I still why like is it redundant or is it just a way of me counting the like the number of of um, energy states? Yeah, so that, that's a good question too. So in the case of harmonic oscillator, mm -hmm. then the energy operator and number operator in some sense are redundant. And that's because harmonic oscillator is so simple. But when you actually introduce some uh, interaction of particles, uh, in addition to simple harmonic oscillator, for example, if you introduce a term like x to the fourth in your Hamiltonian, then they are no longer redundant. You can talk about n and h separately because they don't commute anymore. And they, they and then you, you can talk about the, oh, no, they, they do commute, I apologize, but they have different set of eigenvalues. So it turns out that they are redundant for the harmonic oscillator because you're dealing with such a simple system, but in more realistic systems uh, described by more complicated Hamiltonian, they are no longer redundant. And that also turns out to be the, the, the case in quantum field theory too. So number of operators, uh, sorry, number of particles does not give you straight the energy of the state because you may have interactions between particles. They may repel, they may attract, and, and that kind of interaction would change the energies. If you have the bound state, of course, that lowers the energy of the system uh, because of the binding energy. And so that's different from the number of particles in the system. So the number and energy are no longer redundant. So they are important. Each of them is important. And, and they are separate. Thank you. Okay. Um, right. This answered and my we'll... question. I still have one more. I'm so sorry. Okay, go ahead. Um, the last question will be, I, I'm trying to understand why, like, why do we require the, um, the, the position and the time to be having equal footing? Like, because we would like to unify quantum mechanics with the relativity. And relativity yes. is the, yeah, go ahead. Uh, like, because yesterday I just had the um, general relativity class and it appears to me that the four manifold um, describes like um, the four continuous parameters. Is this why we want to, because the general relativity is formulated having the four manifold, which is a four continuous parameters, which means that we have to down um, uh, demote the operators back to the parameters so that we have to match the relativity. Yeah, that's right. So if you go to both special and general relativity, then you have these uh, uh, the objects like a metric tensor or electromagnetic waves, which have both X and T as an argument of the field. Yeah. So th they are parameters to begin with already and they stay parameters even in quantum field theory and what becomes quantum is the field not space and time i see okay. thank you thank you thanks for all these excellent all questions. questions okay does anybody else has a question um, yes uh, I, okay go ahead professor. mr brian yes um, yes, uh, so I, I had a follow-up question to your answer uh, to Yun's question about the um, promoting time to an operator. Um, I, I've read that um, that the negative energy solutions for the Dirac equation for mm -hmm. positrons, um, mm -hmm. that it, it can equivalently, I guess, equivalently be um, interpreted um, as an electron moving backwards into time. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, if the condition that um, time only moves forward was removed, could you still get a uh, computer solution in QFT? Yeah. Right. 
so that's an excellent question. Of course, we, we will talk about this in the second half of the class. Uh, so the short answer is that you have these strange ideas like particle moving backward in time or negative energy states only because you are trying to deal with the relativistic quantum mechanics. It is the disease of the relativistic quantum mechanics. When you go to quantum field theory, you never talk about particles going backwards in time. You never talk about some state having neg negative energies. Yep, energy is always positive. Everything moves only forward in time. So you don't run into these uh, uh, strange, bizarre pathological ideas. So that's why QFT turns out to be a must to get rid of all these uh, the weird uh, the pathologies when you deal with the relativistic quantum mechanics. So we will talk about this. So uh, uh, don't don't worry uh, uh, about this at this moment, and we will talk about that. Uh, Excellent okay. question. Thank you, um, Ryan Liu. Yeah. Uh, hi, I have a question. Um, okay. Um, so the the, pro the the problem that um, Ying Cheng asked, uh, I feel like because in say in Klein-Gordon theory, we have mm -hmm. um, like each momentum mode is separately acts like um, a harmonic oscillator, right? But what happens if we like apply to um, create an operator to that? Would it happen something like just um, raising the stage up or I don't know what happens. Uh, yeah, so if, if you use the creation operator in Klein Gordon theory, that is a relativistic quantum field theory of spin zero particles, we also talk about this later, uh, then you literally create one boson. So, creation operator really does create particles. So, you increase the number of particles. So, you go from state with 10 to 23 particles to 10 to 23 plus one particles. So you literally change the number of particles. So that's what the creation operator does in QFT. If, what if we apply it like twice? And then you create two particles. With the same momentum in the, in the same mode, right? Yeah, so the, you can create a particle with a definite momentum P using creation operator A of P. You can also create a particle with momentum Q if you use the creation operator A of Q. So for each momentum, you assign a creation operator, which creates a particle of that momentum. Yeah, and but, we, again, we will talk about this later. Okay. Yeah, because I, I feel like it sounds different. Um, when you answer the, the question, it sounds different. Like the, the rating operator um, in harmonic oscillator is different from the create, creation operator in um in qft but um if we just focus on the same um uh, a specific momentum mode i i feel like they are the same then what's the difference between yeah yeah so that's a very good question too so mathematically they look the same so in some sense qft is an infinite set of harmonic oscillators you have a harmonic oscillator for particle with momentum P1. You have another harmonic oscillator for particle P2 and so on and so forth. And you have an infinite collection of harmonic oscillators. So you can view it that way. So mathematically, for a given momentum mode, the, uh, 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 the QFT and, 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 and harmonic oscillating quantum mechanics are identical. But physical interpretation of that is different because in QFT, you really change the number of particles. So if you think of the harmonic oscillator and you have an excited state, and again, the excited state might decay to a ground state by emitting a photon, but you can never ever describe the process using quantum mechanics because that changes the number of particles, namely a photon in this case. So QFT and Q quantum mechanics relies on the same algebraic property of the creation and relation of our operator. So to that extent, they look the same, but we use this creation harmonic and an addition operator for a different purpose between QFT and quantum mechanics. And again, we will talk all about that as we go on. So uh, don't worry if, if that sounds very mysterious, I'm sure it does, but you will see that explicitly uh, in uh, probably next week. Okay. Anything else? 
Okay, the Ryan Luna in this case, the please stop the recording. And then how can you 